Shalom from Jerusalem. This is Powers in Play, TV7 News Israel's program dealing with international relations beyond the scope of the Middle East. And our topic today has to do following a month of fighting between Russia and Ukraine with the ratio of forces between great powers and lesser ones and the lessons one may learn from deterrence, defense, and wars in general. With us in our panel are retired Colonel Miri Eisen, former ambassador and uh, deputy foreign minister Danny Ayalon, not former Danny Ayalon, he is still Danny Ayalon, but only his title. Future Danny Ayalon. Future Danny Ayalon, <laughs> the once uh, and future. Uh, retired uh, or reserve, rather, Brigadier General Doron Gavish, and retired Colonel and Dr. Eran Lerman. Thank you all uh, for coming. Now, um, following the first month of uh, fighting between Russia and Ukraine, following the invasion of Ukraine, it seems to be a unilateral war up to now, no Ukrainian attacks inside Russia for whatever reason. The question arises regarding the world order. Mm -hmm. Does it mean that the superpowers or even great powers have the run of the field for themselves? Because if Russia is not only a declared nuclear power, actually with uh, the bigger number of warheads uh, of all powers, a permanent member of the Security Council, and Ukraine uh, is no match for it. What does it say about the world order, Iran? Well, it's a fascinating question because Russia is an anomaly. It is not a normal great power in the old sense when uh, resources and military capability were roughly matched and the world order uh, could be discerned by the combination of military and economic power. Russia is an economic, I wouldn't say middling, I wouldn't say midget, God forbid, but it's a middling country economically. It's a smaller, it's a productive base, it's industrial base, it's distinct, it's smaller than that of Italy or, or, or South Korea, whom no one would consider great powers. However, it has a disproportionate military capability in which they have invested significantly, and they have a totally disproportionate nuclear deterrent. And that definitely creates an anomaly. Uh, Miri, uh, what uh, Iran uh, describes is actually a Saudi Arabia in reverse. Saudi Arabia being uh, an economic uh, giant, or at least uh, power, with um, a very um, ineffective military force. What does that mean for countries um, looking beyond their own uh, region? Because as uh, Iran mentioned, Italy and South Korea have strong economies. And part of that is that they did not invest in nuclear power. They were content, still are, to remain under the American umbrella, both the uh, uh, unilateral U.S. and uh, NATO, or in the South Korean case, another arrangement. What does that mean for powers in our region? There's no question the world, we're in the middle of the change. One of the fascinating aspects is for us to sit here and try and say, what is that change? And I think that you hit that nail on the head. It's about the nuclear issue, at least for me. Because what it's shown over the last few weeks and as we go in is when you have nuclear power, wow, you can just do things. And I immediately take it both to what's happened over the years with North Korea, what we're looking right now in the negotiations with Iran, Russia, a middling economic power. And it's not even about the conventional weapons. To me, it's about that additional nuclear aspect. When you have nuclear power, and there are very few countries that have nuclear power in general, let alone the amount that Russia has, then you have an edge 
especially, and this is the worst part, when it seems as if you almost have a willingness to use it at a tactical level. In that sense, meaning you're willing to threaten to a certain degree, you view it in a different way. That's a very new, scary world. And all of the Middle East is learning that lesson. You mentioned Saudi Arabia. Everybody's looking at Iran, um, United Arab Emirates. Every single country around is learning that lesson. But look at it from uh, Vladimir Putin's uh, point of view. Um, I have uh, all of these uh, wonderful warheads. I never use them. Uh, can't I at least threaten their use? So for a moment, I'll just say that in my past, I used to, because I studied Syria, and Syria was under Soviet doctrine and then Russian doctrine, there's a Russian military doctrine aspect here, which actually worries me greatly, where I think that in Russia, they differentiate between strategic nuclear weapons, where there you're not going to see that being touched, and between tactical nuclear weapons, where I'm very wary, I think they're being viewed as slightly more than conventional, like not the weapons of mass destruction, oh, that's strategic nuclear warheads. So yes, I think that Vladimir Putin actually could possibly use those, the tactical Well, weapons. this was um, 1950s American doctrine too. They had Honest John um, rockets tactical battlefield rockets. And actually, when the Americans first um, invaded, quote unquote, uh, they landed at uh, Beirut in 1958, uh, because we forgot. Because, because these, um, to help uh, Kamal Shamoun and uh, Fuad Shihab and all of these uh, great statesmen. To keep, uh, Leb to keep Lebanon Christian. <laughs> um, Let's not they, forget that. They, they brought um, their forces with their entire order of battle. And because there was a tactical nuclear launcher as part of the unit, they didn't even think about it. It landed in Beirut. Somebody in Washington got wind of it and told them immediately send it back to, to uh, Europe. So this means that, that Shimon Peres was right Absolutely. and Israel was not the first we'll never to introduce. <laughs> Israel will never be the first. By the way, there were also nuclear, nuclear warheads at... Uh, at uh, Sixth the, Fleet. No, also on Saudi soil. Yes. There was an air base with... Uh, Dharan. In Dharan with nuclear That's capability a, in the 1960s. 1960s. Amir, uh, if you recall in 1952 in Korea, uh, the, uh, the suggestion even contemplating a nuclear option at that time, after, of course, 45, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, cost General Mac uh, MacArthur his, his career. Yeah, in 51. Uh, uh, in 51, yeah, right. So I guess Nagasaki and Hiroshima was, a, in a way, was a watershed. But after that, nobody was even daring to mention it at, until Putin, well, forget uh, Douglas MacArthur, until Putin this year. So, Danny, we'll get back to you in a moment. But, Daron, um, remember before 1991 and then uh, 2003, the uh, Gulf Wars, which the United States and others fought against Saddam Hussein, there was a riddle. How effective is his, quote-unquote, million-man army? Mm. And then it turned out that it was uh, almost a paper tiger. How do you professional military men estimate the combat effectiveness of military organizations, because ahead of this war, we didn't really know how the Russians will match up against the Ukrainians. Yeah, well, that, that's, a, that's a good uh, question. You know, when we're looking on, uh, on what is happening in the last uh, one month, and I think that we, by the way, should be very reserved in what we are saying with a lot of question marks, because we are just I don't know if it is in the middle of the if way, we are, but, but if, we're not in the end of it, that's for sure. If we are too reserved, we'll be out of business here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. But but I, I think it's important to say it. Uh, but, but you know, what, what you basically are looking at is what are the goals that um, uh, those militaries, and this time uh, we're talking about Russia, what is exactly the goals, what they were thinking that they would gain, and what really happened. And it seems that uh, their idea was uh, really um, to, to, I would say, to sweep uh, the ground. And after, I don't think that they 
they even thought that it would take them one month. So there is a question mark of why it, why exactly it is in, it is happening. It's a question of doctrine. It's, it's a question of willingness. How hard would you like to go? I think they understand that going into the, into a city is it's much more complicated than than the fighting around this. So I think that from the military operational point of view, they have uh, some challenges. Again, from, from the Russian uh, point of view, I think that I'm not sure that they estimated how much the Ukrainians would be fighting against them. And I think that probably this is something that uh, surprised them. Uh, Amir, so, can I step in for a sec? Because yes, I, I yes, don't yes, want yes, to push back. Do. Here I am looking at what Russia is doing in the Ukraine in this month, and I'm seeing doctrine. And I'm seeing it being fulfilled. And even worse, from my point of view, I'm seeing the lessons the Russians learned from what they, they the Russians, did in Syria. Meaning they're not going into the cities mm -hmm. and they are doing it from the outside. And they're taking in its own way. They're not rushing in yeah. because of things that happened in Syria. So I, 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 have, I agree. I have no idea where it's going to go. But I don't see this as being yet that the Russians are failing, that they intended, a, yeah. obviously they would have loved it to work otherwise, the Russians. But I'm very wary about it, looking at it and seeing the Russian failure. I think that they did learn lessons and that worries me. I'm waiting for the next stage, as I yeah. said. Well, I'm waiting oh, to, I, bring, I to bring Danny in, but, we, yeah. but just uh, for one uh, mm -hmm. uh, moment, uh, you are in charge of air defense for the Israeli Defense Forces, mm -hmm. and more concretely, the Israeli Air Force. And this is the defensive part of an offensive arm. Now, the Russians or the Soviets earlier were masters of these counterweapons, the anti-tank, the anti-plane, the anti-ship. Uh, we all remember the Elat, mm -hmm. the destroyer, uh, which the uh, Egyptian Navy um, managed uh, to hit. And uh, of course, the Americans remember Francis Gary Powers and his U-2 mm -hmm. in, uh, in Russia uh, in 1960. What happened to them this time around when they were beaten by their own inventions, the, the uh, Javelin and other, and the Stinger and other uh, anti-tank weapons? How come those uh, supposedly, or at least uh, previous masters in this uh, sort of warfare were not prepared for having their own medicine thrown at them. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, first of all, they, they probably did a good job in, <laughs> with those, with those uh, weapons, but but it's not so easy to, to defend yourself against them. It really depends on the terrain. It depends on the tactics. It depends on the doctrine. Of how do you go in? But I think that, you know, we have to look at it from a strategic point of view. And I go back to Miri's point. I don't think that we could say yes yet that there is a failure or something like this. They are close to the cities. Um, the western part of uh, Ukraine is 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 theirs in a way. Eastern. Eastern. So, sorry, uh, it's theirs in a way. So we have to wait and see. Uh, it's not a big success, that's for sure also, mm -hmm. because there is a resistance there from uh, Ukraine. But going back to your to your first question, I think what is really interesting to see is what happened to the West, mm -hmm. because you know, in a, in a way, uh, it, if we are looking at NATO a few years ago and uh, not so far away, I'm not sure that uh, Putin uh, or others. Uh, this is what they expected from the West. This is the way that they expected them, the West to behave, because in a way, you see NATO. NATO now is it's much closed. Um, uh, Article 5 has been uh, in place in, in Poland, for example. There is a deployment of U.S. forces into, into there. I know that Scandinavians are already asking themselves, should we be part of it? So I think that there are some consequences well, of it that uh, well, are interesting to look at. NATO did not uh, disintegrate, but uh, Putin managed to deter it from helping the Ukraine um, in a more practical way. Ukraine he, is not part of, of NATO. That's, that's it. He that. isolated the battlefield, and NATO has stayed out, and uh, NATO is very compassionate, and uh, refugees are being helped. But if you um, go uh, to the professional military uh, intervention level, nothing has happened. Now, Danny, uh, you are an old Washington hand, and you have been there when councils of war regarding 
Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, not uh, in the very first uh, uh, phase, but later on, uh, were considered. And you also uh, know how uh, Joe Biden personally operates from his earlier positions. What is going uh, through his mind now that he is back from Europe, back uh, from uh, his uh, statements, uh, whether planned or impromptu, uh, regarding uh, Putin uh, uh, not being uh, acceptable uh, in power? How will Biden conduct the rest of this crisis? I'm not sure he even knows himself. And I'm not sure about any kind of pre-thinking. He ad-libs mostly. And he has not been known for very systematic thinking or a, he's not an ideologue, he's not a strategist. And I think that shows. It shows uh, throughout the crisis. I think from day one, you know, talking about three months ago, when he was asked about a possible invention, um, invasion to, uh, to the Ukraine by the Russians, he said, it depends. Is it a small invasion? Is it a big invasion? I mean, that gave Putin right there a green light. Uh, also, the fact that he was very adamant about saying what the U.S. will not do. I mean, you don't have to say what they will do, but certainly don't say what they will not do. Keep Putin guessing. But when he said from the start, there is no way we're going to put boots on the ground. There is no way we're going to enforce a no-fly zone. Um, the red line is in the Baltics. It's where the uh, NATO... But wasn't that a message to Volodymyr Zelensky rather than to Putin, not to expect such an intervention? Probably, probably. And, you know, in that respect, Ukraine is what Czechoslovakia was in 1938. And this is what uh, Arik Sharon, which I had the pleasure of uh, being his... At that time, you know, in 2001, his uh, foreign policy advisor, after 9-11, when Sharon and we detected a possible Islamic pressure on the West to put everything on Israel vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, including 9-11, what did he say? Israel Unique. will not be yes. Czechoslovakia to the very, I would say, anger. In Israel, it's Kondo always Israel 1938. And Bush, they, they over calling us. You are insulting us. Are you comparing Bush to Chamberlain? No, but Biden has some kind of resemblance maybe to him, to Chamberlain. Hmm. I actually, I'm not going to say I don't have the relationship, not with President Biden and within that, but I'm going to look at it for a moment. I want to zoom out. Maybe we're in a 30-year war, and this is a stage in the 30-year war of Russia since the disintegration of the Soviet Union, 30 years on and in, 1992, was probably their plot bottom. Food, no food on the shelves, but Russia wants to be Russia. And, and it's taken 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And then I look at the US response and I say, if it's all part of containing Russia, then you're not gonna wanna get into a frontal confrontation over the Ukraine. And I absolutely can see the Ukraine as a sacrificial lamb, horrible type of term. However, that doesn't turn Biden into a chamberlain. It's looking at it in a broader sense of we're not going to get into a face-to-face -face with Russia. Let Russia bog itself down in the Ukraine. But we'll Mary, help that's Zelensky. That's exactly what was the thinking of Chamberlain vis-a-vis -vis Hitler in 38. We of letting not, him into the Czech we will, Republic. We will let uh, Czechoslovakia be the sacrificial mm -hmm. lamb. We will not make, uh, we will not start a world war with Germany over Czechoslovakia. It's very, very, to me, the pattern is the same. Yeah, but, yes, but, then, but then, you know, from, from the other end, Biden is there, the United States is there. Uh, we, we talked about NATO before. The, I mean, he visited uh, Poland. Uh, they are, um, you know, they, they are uh, enforcing uh, Poland with some uh, forces. So it's not that, you know, they, they are uh, sitting back. This is the first thing. And the second thing... They're leading from behind. Mm. Yes, but the, but I think that also the economical section, this is also something that we should look at. Because this is not the war that we remember for uh, World War II. That was a pure military against military. There are other means today. I think that it's very important to, to look on the narrative. Who is, who is, who is who, the West and, and uh, what is happening with Putin today? I think from a narrative point of view, the West is, uh, is able today uh, the, the good ones are there. And, and you see it also from my point of view. You see it also from the reaction of China. 
two, in two the po- last week. Two points and I'll get, so I'll get narratives, to- I think it's important. Uh, economical sanction, it's part of this war and, and we should consider it. And United States is in the lead. Two, two or three points. Uh, Roosevelt was not involved in Munich and then in fact, until Pearl Harbor, he, uh, except for what happened in the North Atlantic uh, regarding the U-boats and land lease, he, he was out. Uh, so uh, the equation, uh, of course, was uh, totally different. Chamberlain waited for the Royal Air Force to, Be to get stronger. This, the public did not know it, but they were not uh, strong enough. And um, in your Air Force's attack helicopters, you are actually leading from behind. <laughs> the gunner sits <laughs> in the front, <laughs> yeah. and, and the mission right. leader is, is behind it. But, Iran, I wanted to, to ask yeah, you, in addition to, your, yeah. to what you're going to say, <laughs> um, you have been the deputy head of the National Security Council, now called National Security Staff. Always was. No, at the beginning... <laughs> the, be- the, we, we have no council, we have staff. The council in America is the president and his, and we have a security cabinet. We are the national security staff to the prime minister and the cabinet. Yes, but Where? but the original yeah. law in 1998, yeah, at but, least called it the uh, council, then it was changed. And back to the Russians and the US. And, yeah. <laughs> no, not to the Russians. The question has to do with net assessment. Yeah. You, uh, you were formerly an intelligence officer looking at the other side. But you must weigh the other side against your own, the blue against the red. How do you do it? In well, such? That, that's one of the most difficult tricks uh, in, in the book because very few people have a, a balanced view of both sides. The Americans have turned this into a methodology uh, and there was a special f- function in the, in, in the Pentagon for many years, still exists, of, of, of assessing uh, all the components. The Americans used to do it for us because they were committed to uh, Israel's qualitative military edge, Q, the, uh, QME. By, by now it's by law. And then and so they offered us assessments of how strong we are as compared to others. They're not that bad at it. In, in 67, the CIA thought we would finish the Arabs in 10 days. It took six, but that's not a, a cardinal mistake. Um, but it's very difficult because there are always elements which go beyond counting tanks and proficiency and, uh, and uh, pro- military capabilities. Clearly, you, you'd have to you know, look at technologies. For example, if you put a Merkava in the, in the field. A tank. Uh, a, a Merkava tank. And within four kilometers range, there are six T-62s. What are the ratios of power? It's not six to one. It's one tank with six targets because they cannot hit uh, from that distance. So you have to bring a lot of technological elements into the equation. But at the end of the day, there is the unexpected, like a Zelensky. I mean, the, this entire failure of, of Putin, and I think it's by now uh, clear that he has issues with his uh, assessment crowd. The Russians were never very good at assessment, but now clearly he's getting rid of some people who sold him a bill of goods on, on the Ukraine. Uh, the story is about Zelensky. The assumption was that the uh, brothers, Ukrainian brothers, would get rid of this Jewish comedian um, the moment they see a Russian tank in their direction. Instead, the opposite happens. This is more or less the, the, the miscalculation that uh, Hitler made when he assumed the British would surrender after France falls. Well, if Halifax was there, it would have happened, but there was Churchill. So he, he so was he, considered human dimension. He was considered an Alexander Dubček by the Russians. Of sorts. Well, uh, it's it's disproportionate. This is this is not the Soviet Union crushing Czechoslovakia. This is Russia, a much smaller proposition at the end of the day, uh, unless they go nuclear. Fighting a nation of 40 million, of which 10 million are on their side anyway, but they don't count. Bec- uh, and, so and another 10 million in our, have almost and left. And, already. and 4 million have uh, women and children and so elderly four. have left, but the men stay behind, whether they like it or not, they stay behind, but they seem to stay and fight. And this, um, the, the element, the unexpected element, resilience, uh, is a very important thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, aspect of the story. But I will say, yeah, in, in this respect precisely, uh, Don was right, I think there the, the is one student of this situation that matters. 
one student, Putin, Xi no, no. Jinping. What Chinese. is China learning from Putin's for the for the cost to Putin of what is happening regarding Taiwan or in general? Regarding Taiwan is specifically, but more generally. Um, in in the Jerusalem Strategic Tribune, we carried a piece by uh, Azar Gat, who's a se very serious scholar, saying that war is becoming less and less attractive as a proposition. Unfortunately, it came out just before the war began. However... Why didn't you send it to Putin, that in draft, <laughs> at least? But isn't it becoming but, but less that, attractive for those... But that's, that's, that's the story here. How can you assess the, uh, what's going to happen when somebody is about to make a terrible mistake? But Iran, maybe it's from a different point of view. It Meaning, is. in the West, war is less and less attractive, and it actually gives an advantage to those who are willing to take that step. I find it to be a horrific catch-22. You, you know, in, 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 is, in Israel... Will, how will this be read three months, a year, five years from now, in terms of the cost to Russia of Putin's... Decision? You know, in Israel, um, in October of 1973, not only before uh, the Egyptian forces started crossing the Suez Canal, but even later, they kept saying, Diane and others, this is against all logic. Um, it's it's uh, such hey, an adventure. To quote the which princess might... bride, inconceivable. Yeah. I think it means something yeah. else. Yeah, you, you, you try to force the other guy's <laughs> logic. Uh, but, but Daron, um, looking at it from the uh, professional military echelon uh, point of view, uh, when you come with recommendations to the political masters, how uh, much of a value do they put on what you say regarding your chances of success militarily only? They have domestic politics to consider. They have the United States and other factors. But um, do the political uh, powers that be consider your assessment of the military situation very highly? In your case, by the way, um, 11 years ago, when you put Iron Dome uh, into first use, you had expectations, but you couldn't be sure uh, how uh, successful it will be and how it will impact uh, later campaigns. Yeah. You know, first of all, it, it really depends who is the leader, you know, because there, there are some leaders who are listening to the military uh, uh, advisors, let's put it this way. And there are other leaders that they think does that it they have, know. Does it have anything to do with their own military background? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, it has to, to do probably with their personality, who are they, how strong they, they, they believe, uh, on, and I would say on what they are on, uh, on their own way of uh, thinking. Um, so, you know, in, in general, I think that the leaders are, of course, listening to what military people uh, would tell them and the military personnel and their advisors. But at the end of the day, it's on their own shoulder. They make their own decisions. Uh, Sometimes, uh, you know, they, they would see that uh, it was it was a good uh, decision. Sometimes uh, they would have to adapt. Uh, but I think that, you know, even on those in on what we are seeing now, uh, there, there are dynamics and things are changing. And uh, so if it is decisions that are OK for today, maybe they are different from. Uh, so let's hear it more. from the horse's mouth or the deputy horse, uh, <laughs> at least. And it's <laughs> or from the horse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In, it's interesting, uh, Danny, you were deputy to Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman. It was interesting to see in the run-up to the uh, Russian invasion that there were two uh, Soviet-era immigrants to Israel, uh, one with Moldovan background, that is Lieberman, and one with the Ukrainian or semi-Ukrainian background, and that is Zev Elkin. Lieberman uh, was sure that Putin will not invade. Yeah. Elkin said he would. Um, right. when, when you took part in such uh, cabinet uh, sessions, um, was the atmosphere influenced by intuition, by personal background, or by professional recommendations? Well, I would say, I mean, roughly, probably 80% is intuition. 80% is intuition, and many leaders would like, I mean, they hear what they want to hear. And the interpretation is very much based on their own experience, 
their own personality, um, their own state of mind, and everything like that. If I can say something in jest, um, you know, the Moldovan one that you mentioned. It cost you once uh, yeah. being in jest. <laughs> right. Um, Moldova. The fact that he said that Putin will not invade may be some part of a psychological um, um, you know, warfare. Um, but I'm not, uh, this is in jest, I'm not uh, suggesting that he is uh, representing Putin's interest in the country. Or in no, the, not uh, at in all. The, but uh, Zev Elkin is a Ukrainian, I guess. Uh, uh, the Ukrainians, um, you know, uh, being so close to this bear, uh, felt the, the, the Russian um, threat and uh, imminent threat much better than Moldova, which was in a way uh, not on the cross side of of, uh, of Putin. No, but yeah. but we we all know by now that uh, in uh, 2009, 10, when you were there, and uh, in a couple of years later when Iran was also there, regarding Iran, the uh, professional military and intelligence uh, yeah. officials had a lot of impact, along with others. Right. But on Gaza and Lebanon, how much uh, was that a factor? Or because the government did not intend to send uh, ground troops, boots on the ground into Gaza, it only reinforced what the politicians wanted to do or not to do anyway. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we have seen uh, probably in the last, well, I think since Lebanon, first Lebanon war, second Lebanon war, and of course, 18 years, uh, in the quagmire of uh, of Lebanon, the uh, aversion and I would say fright almost of leaders from Israeli casualties, and mm-hmm. I think Israel is the only country in the world where military casualties are preceding civilian ones. You know, we call our, ch- uh, our the military yeah. children. So when you look at uh, military uh, casualties, it seems to be much more horrific than civilian. So I think from Lebanon war and on, we have seen this as a uh, like the governing rule for governments. Definitely, they do not want to involve ground troops. And when the military is also, you know, in assessments before and giving them some horrific uh, estimates that an invasion to Gaza will cost a thousand casualties or more, that in a way sways the decision against uh, boots on the ground. I have a very different take on this, if I may. Uh, I think the reason the IDF profession has advised against uh, taking Gaza is not because they fear casualties and is not because they think they would fail. It is because they are absolutely certain they would succeed. And then we would be the owners of this piece of territory. Oh, succeed they would, but the cost, the cost oh, is the issue. The cost is not the cost of... of not the con- immediate one, Not but the cost of conquest, the, the cost of having to run the, the, the place for years on end uh, without any uh, clear-cut purpose. This is what the military has been trying to avoid. And I say to a large extent, it is the military that set the tone in, in cabinet discussions that I attended. Yeah, you wanted to comment. And as usual, I'm in the why is it either or. When you have people around the, the table, especially in Israel, both in the Israeli cabinet and in the upper Israeli security tiers, you have vastly different voices that come into the room from the beginning. But here I very much agree in that sense with Dawn that at the end, the decision is the politicians. They have to stand up with it. The voice that says humanitarian in general the civilian casualties, the fact that we view our soldiers as casualties and not as military casualties is very unique to Israel. Most people aren't aware that it's drafted military, that as you said, it's our kids. And then when you say children, everybody thinks, oh my God, they have children, soldiers, and it's such a horrible... (laughs) No, because most Israelis, when they talk about it in English, they'll say, you know, it's our kids, and that sounds so horrible. But it is our next generation that is drafted. And as such, we want to protect them even though they're supposed to protect us. So if I zoom out again in that sense and the lessons learned in this case, I definitely think that it has to do with that West versus Russia, perhaps, as I said, a bit different from before. I think that nowadays there are leaders in the world that are willing to use their military force 
in the way that Russia right now is against Ukraine. And when you're not willing to use your military force, yeah, you're willing to sacrifice Ukraine, but you're not sending in your own soldiers because all of the West right now are all for the Ukraine. But do you see anybody willing to come and volunteer to fight on Ukrainian soil to be against the big bad Russia? No, I'm willing to sacrifice the others for that ideal. And I think that Israel is not different in that sense. As I said, it's not either or. We're within the dilemma. We do use force, but we also protect ourselves. It's a very big dilemma. Yeah. Yes, Doron, regarding uh, the reassessment, which of course uh, is a work in progress, uh, the uh, war is not over, uh, not enough data, obviously uh, lessons learned will we'll have to wait. But following such an event, such a momentous event, which is um, up to now at least the defining event of 2022 and uh, this uh, period. Probably the 21st century. At least the, 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 first the, the first quarter of it, exactly. How, how do uh, professional militaries go about this process of review and then revision of doctrine following such a war? Of course, this is something to, to look at, because as we said, we, we didn't have such an event in the last, uh, I don't know, 30 years, maybe more. Uh, and it's happening in Europe. So... I think it's something really to look at. Uh, it is more important, I think, at this point. I mean, we could look on the tactics and some of the operation parts, but it's more important to look at it from the, from the strategic point of view, military strategic point of view. What are the right uh, strategies? Uh, how Are they effective, yes or no? Those are, those are really the things that uh, you want uh, to see. Uh, how do you um, um, adapt yourself to, to the situation? because you continuously need to, to be adaptive to, to what is happening on the ground. So this is, I think, what, what militaries are looking at. You, you set the goals, you, the one that decided to invent it, you set the goals, are you meeting those goals? Can you adapt yourself? From a strategic point of view, do, do, you, uh, do you gain those, uh, uh, I would say, um, roles that uh, you decided, or goals that you had in your mind? Did you gain them? Yes, no. Th those are the things that uh, I think we should uh, look at. But one, one word that I wanted to, to add to what was uh, discussed before. I think, you know, from the military perspective, we were talking about uh, what the West will understand. And we know that there is a reluctance from, from the West to fight or to go to military means. But look what happened in Germany. The amount of money that is putting now into the defense of it. Money is not people. Money is not people, but, but you know, at the end of the day, they, someone would have, would have to, uh, to utilize those, those uh, weaponers. So it's not that they, I, I think that on, also from this point of view, uh, the lesson learned are that uh, uh, we still need militaries. It's not something that... Uh, but we, professional we military... Not uh, conscription, not compulsory, universal. I don't, yeah, I, I agree. But it's not, let's forget it. I mean, I think that there is kind of a wake-up call that, uh, okay, we thought that the uh, economy would be everything. But I think that what we see now, again, this is the seeds of it, is that, um, you know, we need military capabilities. This is also something that I think kind of a lesson learned that is, is being learned, I would say. Iran, would you agree, I want to put in a good word for the U.S. military. Mm -hmm. um, armies or militaries in general are always being blamed for preparing for the last war. But for the uh, last several years, the uh, U.S. military has warned the administration, uh, first the Trump administration, now Biden's, that the uh, global war on terrorism is a thing of the past and that they should prepare for peer, peer for what they call peer, peer, or, peer or near peer, either China or Russia. And they started mainly Russia, mainly China. They mainly started. China. Yes, they say China in 2030 yes. or 2040. Yes. But Stavridis, it takes this book is basically a reflection of things. That right. So it's so it takes a, internally. a long, a long time. But is it is it too long? a process when, when Putin can undercut it by not waiting for the other side to be ready. If you're going to be ready in uh, five or seven years, I'll do it now. Well, the question, of course, is, uh, is this a question of readiness? The U.S. has the capacity to intervene. It is not doing it for a, one straightforward reason. That's nuclear deterrence. The Russians have bluntly and, and aggressively drawn, uh, drawn the line 
uh, uh, in terms of, of, of nuclear deterrence. In terms of military capability, I have no question that the U.S. military is far better prepared uh, than, than, than the, um, the Russian recruits. That's true. Israel has not, uh, has a, is a different case. We have very good reasons to remain on the draft system for reasons, uh, for reasons that are not necessarily connected mm -hmm. to the professionalism of the individual soldier. But National ethos is, is also important. Ethos yeah. and, 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 and by the way, and also Solidarity. bringing the best and the brightest to the technology units is a benefit that Israel has and no That's one That's the quality so, of edge. Uh, we, yes. Mm -hmm. We have uh, only a moment, only a minute, and uh, you are leading into the perennial question, which is not nice, but uh, sometimes has to be asked, is it good for the Jews? <laughs> in, in one word, how will Israel come out of the Russia-Ukraine war? Better off, same, worse off? Well, we're still in the middle of the game. So far, politically, Israel has gained some prominence with the uh, mediation. Uh, you see, that. both a politician and a diplomat. Thank you. Miri. <laughs> oh, I think worse. I think that we are put in between a rock and a hard place, and over time it's not going to play out well for us. General Gavish? I think that um, Israel is trying really to, to balance it its way. And um, f from my point of view, at, at this point, I think that it's, it's the right balance. Yeah. I think, unfortunately, uh, I wish this didn't happen. But Israel is gaining diplomatically, demographically, because we have a number of people coming, uh, as an energy exporter, which we are now and in terms of the world understanding of our perspective on military matters. General Gavish, Colonels Eisen and Lerman, and Ambassador, Deputy Foreign Minister Ayalon, thank you all, and we will be here next month for another edition of Powers in Play. Thank you, and see you again.